Hotel Eldridge had always been an enigma, wrapped in the heart of the city like a forgotten relic. Its walls, draped in the ivy of time, spoke of grandeur that once was. As the new night manager, I found myself drawn to its antiquated charm, the kind that whispered tales of opulence now faded. Yet, amid its allure, there was an unsettling undercurrent that I couldn't shake off. My first encounter with Corridor 4 came on a rain-soaked Tuesday. The patter against the century-old windows played a melancholic symphony, a fitting backdrop for my nightly rounds. That's when I heard it for the first time, the unmistakable sound of a child crying. The sobbing was distant, yet piercingly clear, echoing through the desolate hallway. It was said that guests often reported this phenomenon, but experiencing it firsthand was unnerving. The cries seemed to beckon, urging me to uncover their source. I delved into the hotel's archives, the musty scent of old papers and forgotten stories hanging heavy in the air. The records were a gateway to the past, revealing a tapestry of lives that had passed through these halls. It was here that I stumbled upon the tragic tale of Room 413. Decades ago, a devastating fire had claimed the life of a young child. The family, shrouded in grief, left no trace behind, but their sorrow seemed to have seeped into the very bones of the building. Nights turned restless, with the cries growing more fervent, as if the child's spirit was growing impatient. Guests in rooms adjacent to Corridor 4 complained of sleepless nights, plagued by the sounds of weeping that chilled them to the bone. My investigation led me to an elderly housekeeper, Mrs. Alcott, who had been with the hotel since her youth. Her eyes, clouded with years, held a knowing glimmer as she recounted the story of the child in room 413. You can feel it, can't you? She whispered, her voice a tremulous echo of memories. The sadness that lingers like a shadow. That poor child, lost and alone, searching for comfort in a world that has moved on. The atmosphere in the hotel grew heavier, the air thick with an unspoken dread. Guests checked out in hasty departures, leaving the hotel in an eerie silence. I found myself drawn to room 413, now locked and abandoned, its door a barrier to a sorrowful past. The cries seemed to emanate from within, a soulful plea that resonated deep within me. As I stood in the dimly lit corridor, the cries grew louder, more desperate. It was in that moment that I realized the true nature of my role in this haunting. The child's spirit was not merely a remnant of the past. It was an active presence, seeking solace in a world it no longer belonged to. The realization sent a shiver down my spine, a foreboding sense that this story was far from over. The nights grew longer in the Hotel Eldridge, each hour stretching out like a taut string waiting to snap. My obsession with the cries in Corridor 4 deepened drawing me into a labyrinth of shadows and whispers. The once grand hotel now felt like a mausoleum, housing not just the memories of the past, but also its restless spirits. One evening, as the clock struck midnight, I ventured to room 413. The key, old and rusted, turned with a creak in the lock, a sound that seemed to echo the despair trapped within. The room was shrouded in dust and decay, untouched by time. In the center, the remnants of what was once a child's bed stood, its charred frame a stark reminder of the tragedy that had occurred. As I stood there, the air turned cold, a chill that seeped into my bones. The weeping began again, this time so close it was as if the child was standing right beside me. The sound was heart-wrenching, a manifestation of pain and loneliness that transcended time. It was then that I saw it, a fleeting shadow, the silhouette of a child, moving with a slow, purposeful gait. My heart raced, and a cold sweat broke out on my forehead as I realized that the spirit was not just an echo. It was an entity, trapped in an endless cycle of grief. The next day, I met with a local historian, Mr. Davidson, whose knowledge of the hotel's past was unparalleled. Over cups of bitter coffee, he painted a vivid picture of the hotel's heyday and its subsequent fall into obscurity. The fire in room 413, he explained, was a dark blot in the hotel's history, a subject often avoided by the locals. The child, they say, was never found, Mr. Davidson said, his voice dropping to a hush. 
Some believe the spirit searches for something or someone, unable to move on without it. His words resonated with me, igniting a determination to help the lost soul find peace. But how does one help a spirit, a mere wisp of what once was? The question haunted me, following me through the deserted corridors of the hotel. The encounters with the child's spirit became more frequent. Objects in the room moved inexplicably, as if guided by an unseen hand. The cries turned to whispers, words muffled by the veil between our worlds. I felt a profound sadness, a connection to the child's plight that was both terrifying and poignant. It was in these moments of eerie communion that I began to uncover the truth. The child was not just mourning its own death, it was mourning the loss of its family, the life it never got to live. The tragedy was not just in its death, but in its isolation, trapped in a purgatory of its own making. As the story of the child in room 413 consumed me, the hotel itself seemed to respond. Lights flickered without cause, doors slammed shut by unseen forces, and the air grew thick with anticipation. It was as if the building was alive, a silent witness to the sorrow that permeated its walls. The nights at the Hotel Eldridge had become a canvas for the spectral play of light and shadow. Each corner seemed to whisper secrets, and every creak of the wooden floors felt like a step taken by the unseen child. My quest to uncover the truth behind the haunting of room 413 had led me to an unexpected discovery, a hidden diary belonging to the hotel's former owner. The diary, bound in faded leather, was a window into the past, filled with entries that chronicled the days leading up to the tragic fire. As I poured over the brittle pages, a narrative unfolded, one steeped in sorrow and regret. The owner, tormented by the loss of life under his watch, spoke of a child, a boy named Samuel, whose laughter once filled the halls. Samuel's presence in the hotel was a secret known only to a select few, a hidden joy in a life otherwise mired in the mundane. The more I read, the more the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Samuel was not just any child. He was the owner's illegitimate son, hidden away in room 413 to avoid scandal. The fire, it seemed, was no accident, but a consequence of a clandestine life led behind closed doors. My heart ached for Samuel, a boy who knew nothing but the confines of that room, his existence a mere shadow in the grand tapestry of the hotel's history. The realization brought a new depth to my encounters with his spirit. The whispers, the fleeting glimpses, were cries for recognition, for acknowledgement of a life that was cruelly snuffed out. Emboldened by this newfound knowledge, I set out to make things right. I organized a small ceremony in room 413, a gesture of remembrance for Samuel. The local priest, hesitant at first, agreed to bless the room, his words a balm for the lingering unrest. That night, as I stood in the dimly lit corridor, I felt a change in the air. The usual chill was replaced by a warmth, as if the hotel itself was breathing a sigh of relief. The cries had ceased, and in their place there was a silence, profound and peaceful. But the story of Corridor 4 was not yet complete. In the quiet that followed, I heard a new sound, a faint laughter, a sound so rare in these halls. It was Samuel, I was certain, his spirit finally finding the joy that had eluded him in life. The hotel, once a place of sorrow, began to change. Guests spoke of a comforting presence in Corridor 4, a feeling of being watched over by a benevolent guardian. The rooms filled up again, the laughter of the living mingling with the echoes of the past. Yet, as the days passed, a nagging doubt remained. Had I truly helped Samuel? Or had I merely placated my own conscience? The question lingered, a shadow at the edge of my thoughts, as I continued to walk the halls of the Hotel Eldridge, now a keeper of both its history and its mysteries. The Hotel Eldridge had transformed in the weeks following the ceremony for Samuel. Guests came and went, oblivious to the history that lingered in the air, a history I was now intimately a part of. Yet beneath the surface of normalcy, a current of unease flowed, a reminder that some stories never truly end. It was during a particularly stormy night, when the wind howled like mournful specters, that I felt a shift in the atmosphere. 
the air grew heavy, charged with a palpable sense of expectation. Drawn once again to room 413, I found the door ajar, creaking softly in the gusts that swept through the corridor. Inside, the room was different. The oppressive air of sorrow that once filled it had lifted, replaced by a chilling stillness. And there, in the center of the room, stood Samuel. Not a shadow or a fleeting glimpse, but a tangible presence, his eyes meeting mine with an intensity that rooted me to the spot. Thank you, he whispered, his voice a mere breath, yet clear as a bell. The words resonated deep within me, a confirmation of the peace I had hoped to bring him. But as he spoke, a sorrowful smile touched his lips, a smile that spoke of farewells. I must leave now, he continued, his form starting to fade like mist at the break of dawn. But I wanted you to know you set me free. As his figure dissipated, a rush of emotions overwhelmed me. Relief, sadness, and a profound sense of loss. Samuel, the child who had become the heart of the hotel's mystery, was moving on, leaving behind the earthly confines that had been both his sanctuary and his prison. The days that followed were marked by a quietude that had long been absent from the hotel. Corridor 4, once a place of whispered fears and unseen tears, now basked in a tranquil hush. Guests no longer spoke of eerie cries or unsettling chills. Instead, they commented on the peaceful ambiance, unaware of the transformation that had taken place. Yet, in the calm that now enveloped the hotel, I found myself grappling with a void. The absence of Samuel's presence left a space that was difficult to fill. I had grown accustomed to the mystery, to the purpose that his story had given me. Now, I was just the night manager of a hotel, one with a history less palpable, its whispers silenced. The final entry in my own journal read like a tribute, not just to Samuel, but to all the forgotten stories that hide in the shadows of old places. My time at the Hotel Eldridge was coming to an end, a chapter closing in the book of my life. As I locked the door to room 413 for the last time, I felt a breeze, a gentle caress that felt like a final goodbye. The hotel, with its secrets and its spirits, would continue on, its walls holding the echoes of a thousand stories. But for me, it was time to step out of the shadows, carrying with me the lessons of the past and the echoes of a child's laughter that would forever linger in the corridors of my memory.